All right, I'm going to get started. Thank you. So welcome to our first listening session uh, on the proposed new public safety facility. Uh, we've had several public meetings, which you'll hear about shortly, over the last, I believe we started in uh, 2000. 18 with a vote of town meeting, which I'm going to take you through. So it's really been a four-year process to date. Obviously, like everything else, COVID had its impact on this project, and it had to come to a halt for a little, a few months there, and then we tried to pick it back up again. So we're grateful that you're all here, and I just, uh, I, I want to acknowledge the members of the Public Safety Facility Advisory Committee, and I know Kevin. Uh, Kennedy, who's the chair of the committee, is going to be speaking to you right after me. And there is a slide there with everyone's names on it, because I want you to see all the residents who put so much work into this project for that committee was actually appointed in 2019. So they've been together a little over three years. So thank you. Also want to uh, acknowledge some of the other speakers you're going to hear from tonight. So after Kevin, uh, you're going to hear from Fire Chief Coleman, uh, Police Chief uh, Lemon, and Ed Kazanovich, who's the current Assistant Town Manager slash CFO. And as many of you probably know, I'm retiring on January 30th. So January 31st, Ed becomes the next Town Manager of Auburn. So I'm thrilled for that, too. So I'm going to try to make this transition smooth for all of you. So welcome. Thank you for coming. I just want to start and give you a little bit of a history. also want to just note that this is being live streamed by Auburn Cable Television, and it's also being taped. So if you want to see it again, if you want to let your, your neighbors know, your friends know, um, and you have other town meeting members that you're, you're friendly with, let them know that they can see it again if they didn't make it to tonight's presentation. So what I mentioned before is, sorry, I'm just going to slide this. Uh, on October, in October of 2017, I see some, uh, thankfully, a number of town meeting members. Town meeting voted to appropriate $150,000 from free cash per our financial policy to hire a consultant to study and evaluate our existing public safety buildings. And this included the public, uh, excuse me, the police and fire buildings. And so there were three buildings, the current police headquarters, the fire rescue headquarters, and the second fire station on West Street. We asked, we plan to ask the consultant to look at four options. Renovation of the existing facilities, expansion of one or more of the existing facilities, construction of separate police and fire facilities, and construction of a joint public safety facility. So with that, we issued a request for qualifications under Mass General Law Chapter 30B for a consulting firm to conduct this analysis. And this study included the evaluation of all the facilities I just mentioned, a spatial needs assessment, site and conceptual building plans, floor plans, uh, exterior conceptual designs, and cost estimates. Under Mass General Law, when you have a project of that size where you're spending $150,000 for a consultant study, that's going to lead to a significant development project. You are required to develop a designer selection policy and procedure. I'm going to back that up. So uh, under the law, I put together, uh, in, in conjunction, Ed and I put together and was approved by the board, a designer selection policy and procedure that will be in place now for future projects as well. And through that, we appointed a designer selection committee to review the bids received to make a recommendation to us. So when we received the bids, the designer selection committee reviewed all the bids, interviewed all of the bidders, and they recommended Tecton Architects. Uh, so we went with Tecton. They've been tremendous to work with. They're excellent. They have a lot of experience in Massachusetts and beyond in public safety facilities. We executed that contract in the fall of 2018, and Tecton immediately began their analysis. This took quite some time. Uh, it took, thank you, <laughs> much better, thank you. It took several months for Tecton to get this underway. In the meantime, uh, we appointed a public safety facility advisory committee. And we're going to get into that in a minute, and I'm going to turn it over to Kevin to go through that. But the public safety committee started to meet in August of 2019. So by the time, fast forward, by the time we hired Tecton, they got started, and the committee met in August of 19. Tecton had done a really significant evaluation of all of these buildings, and they were able to come in and meet with the committee and show them what some of the barriers were in each of the properties, what some of the opportunities were, and what some of the issues were in each property. 
So given that, uh, Tecton is still with us. They are still our consultant. They've guided us through the whole process. They've given us updated numbers as we need them. And I'm going to turn it over right now to Kevin Kennedy, who is the chair of the committee. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Kevin Kennedy. For those that don't know me, uh, resident of the town of Auburn. Uh, I was just thinking about how long I've been a resident, and it's been 55 zero years now. Uh, it's hard to believe, um, but part of this great community. Uh, I was tasked uh, or volunteered to be part of the Public Safety Facility uh, Advisory Committee. Uh, and then my, uh, my counterparts, I think, uh, summarily uh, gave me the chairmanship role, which uh, I think they all stepped back, and uh, I, I was left standing there. But I was happy to do it. It was a great group of people, uh, of residents of the town, uh, some who had some public safety or affiliated with the police, some affiliated with the fire department, some who had no affiliation with public safety whatsoever. So as Julie mentioned, it's been three years. It's hard to believe that it's been three years that uh, we came together and started looking at this project. And I'll be the first to say I had some preconceived notions of what our public fa uh, safety facilities looked like. Um, from the outside, you know, other than West Street, I thought things looked pretty good. Uh, and we had that sort of uh, mission to, uh, to look at them, to see whether they could be renovated. Um, closer? Is that better? Much closer? It's, now it's right in my face. Okay, okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, but now how loud that is, Chris. Uh, so, we will to look to see if they could be renovated. Uh, could they be, the current sites be expanded upon? Should we be looking at multiple facilities or should we be looking at a combined public safety facility? So we started off with tours, uh, looking at the facilities, getting an inside look as to what was there, what some of the uh, positive aspects of the facilities were, and then some of the negative aspects of the facility. And the chiefs uh, are gonna cover their respective facilities, I believe, tonight, and show you some of the the, uh, the positives and the, and the negatives of our current facilities. Uh, so we quickly learned that expansion was really not an option uh, based on the sites. Uh, renovation of the current facilities probably was not an option as well, and they'll cover some of the, the issues with the facilities as to why that was not an option. Uh, so it ultimately came that we were gonna be looking for uh, a new site to decide whether it should be a combined public safety facility or separate type facilities. And our initial recommendation as a committee was a combined public safety facility. Uh, Repurposing uh, the police station, there was discussion about the school department moving to that, that facility. Uh, closing down the Auburn Street fire location and the chief will cover some of the reasons and what would that would probably be sold. But ultimately to do a combined public safety facility. And then it came to the task of where do we locate a public safety facility? Uh, I don't think any of us realized that was gonna be the most daunting task of this entire thing uh, for us as a committee. Uh, there really is not a ton of property out there. And when you came, to, we learned through uh, the fire chief and through Tecton, through the, uh, the consultants in this project, that public safety facilities, in particular fire facilities, have to be centrally located. Fire department is, does a very good job of tracking their response times to uh, their calls for service. Uh, that response time can actually affect our uh, homeowners insurance rates because the fire service and insurance industries have set standards for how long it takes fire trucks to, to reach all components of the town. So we had a very small window. Uh, Deputy Chief Johnson did a great job showing exactly how tight that window was gonna be. Uh, it, as to where we could be looking for a centralized fire facility. Uh, Chief Lemon, you know, pointed out for the police, it's not really a factor. Their cruisers are out in their respective sectors uh, on patrol, uh, but fire apparatus is, you know, in the facilities waiting to respond. So uh, we, they came down for a set of s sites, and uh, Chief Coleman, please help me if I, if I miss any. The sites that really drew our interest were the Sears Automotive site um, on the outskirts, and again, it seems very close, but just outside of that was gonna be the Shaw's uh, property, and the other site was gonna be the, and it, you can, through your iterations of living in town, whether it was the Yankee Drummer, 
uh, the Lowe's, or now it's, uh, I think, one of the, the uh, car dealerships, Langway uh, property uh, up by the Mass Pike. Um, so those were all looked at, and I won't get into the details as to how it was uh, sort of just sent out, but bids were sent out or to see who was interested in selling the property. And surprisingly, you would think uh, there would be people willing to sell their property. Nobody had any interest. We had a bit of a delay with COVID uh, meeting, and as a committee, we requested the town administration to go back out one more time. We said, okay, maybe things have changed uh, in their business models and their business plans for those properties that we were looking at. Again, put it out. Uh, those properties were aware that we were looking to buy property in town, and again, no response. None of those properties wanted to sell us, um, none of those owners wanted to sell us their properties. So the committee went back uh, and looked at a new proposal that was put before us, which was the proposal that you'll see here tonight, which was to go away from one central public safety facility to go to a retention of the Auburn Street Fire Facility, which would become, in effect, uh, one of the fire substations, and then redeveloping uh, the West Street site uh, into a police headquarters and fire headquarters. And I certainly will let the others here look at that, uh, but that ultimately is the benefit there was the town owns that piece of property on West Street, and we can move forward from there without uh, the issues that we ran into for land. So I just wanted to, the, the chiefs are gonna go over this uh, more in depth. I just wanted to kind of touch upon that it's been three years of us looking at this, uh, looking at it in depth. Um, right from you know, the days of tours to listening to the architects to uh, looking to what was in the best interest of the community, what the needs were of the community, uh, and definitely um, they'll, they'll cover that more tonight. Um, but def thank you to the, uh, the committee who's uh, stood by for three years. Hello? Okay. Oh, and there's, there's, there's my members of the committee, but thank you to all of them. Uh, I do, will say tonight, if you see me sneak out, I did have a previous commitment. I have to be at St. John's at 7 o'clock, um, so I'm not leaving for a lack of interest in being here. I wish I could be here for the entire time, but thank you uh, for everybody that came out tonight. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, I just want to ask Fire Chief Steve Coleman, are you coming up next to, oh, I'm sorry. Police Chief Todd Lemon, and I just want to note, so Chief Lemon has, uh, he's been the, initially he was the interim or acting chief in the beginning of February, and then he was appointed full-time chief in June, but he has actually been involved in this project since the very beginning, when he was a lieutenant. He was the one that was assigned to go to all of the meetings, so uh, Chief Lemon's very aware of all the project, and like I said, he's been involved in the beginning. I also just want to acknowledge that we have our new deputy Police Chief here, Scott Mills, our first time we've had that position, which is great. And we also have Deputy Fire Chief Glenn Johnson here as well. And I see a number of members of the Police and Fire Department. Really want to thank you for everything you do. Thanks for being here tonight and showing your support. All right, let's do our... So good evening, folks. Thanks for coming out. Uh, appreciate your support. A um, little impromptu, I have occupied two police facilities. I've been in, served in the town of Auburn, proudly starting as a patrolman 31 years ago here. I lateraled over from uh, the Charlton Police Department to Auburn, and I've never looked back. I love this community, feel very supported by the, uh, the town meeting members and the members of local government, and Steve and I are very fortunate to, uh, to have uh, such support from this community. So. I'm gonna delve right into this. So that was the facility that I moved into. Uh, initially, when I came over here, that was about a 20-year facility on Auburn Street. Southbridge uh, Street opened in uh, 1970. I was told by the fire chief today that the police department moved into the DPW in 1965, and I contacted one of my friends that's uh, a resident in town who's a little bit older than me, and I asked him where the police department was prior to that. 
And uh, he said he did not know. But however, we moved into that in 1970, and um, Ron Miller was the police chief at the time, and he was work he knew that we had we were fast vastly outgrowing that building, and he uh, moved towards um, approaching the town to build and develop another facility. So in July of 2000, we moved out of the current location onto Oxford Street North, and the skinny gentleman to your right. Uh, that would be the former Chief, Chief Slucas at the time, is a patrolman, and uh, Sergeant Sullivan to the left. This is the current police station. We opened in 2000, um, built at a different time than today. Uh, there's nobody really foresaw at the time the explosion in technology with regards to computers and networking and all the IT uh, improvements that were not only going to be needed but required. Uh, for the state and for our operations. The former police chief, Bill Stone, had the foresight to run Cat5 cable, which he bought himself and actually wired the building himself uh, in that particular location when the contractor was putting it up. So we currently have in dispatch, there's a note here, we have two dispatches on duty, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That was partially by design. I'll try not to bore you with the minutiae of this, but once we moved in to this building, the cell block was designed to be on the lower level, and we're required to check prisoners every 15 minutes. And um, so by design, we couldn't have the dispatchers leaving their 911 PSAPs uh, and walking away from the, from the call center, and the fix on that was to pull a police officer off, off the road that was counterproductive to our operations. So we immediately, from moving into that building, had to double our dispatching staff. And for the last uh, 20 plus years, we've had two full-time dispatches, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 1991 staffing, briefly, one police chief, three sergeants, eight patrol officers, and three dispatches slash matrons. And uh, currently, fast forward to 22, 2022, for operational needs, call volume uh, increases exponentially. We now are slated for 41 sworn positions. So we, we the, the building at the time when we first moved in certainly met its needs, but our growth outpaced the uh, scope of what we could utilize uh, operationally and, and with, with good organization within the building. So as you can see, there's a couple of photos here, uh, and you'll see our drone unit showing off some of the photos uh, in a moment. We really um, have a dire need for parking. Uh, we, we, as you can see, the, the parking lot uh, to the left is, is approaches the lobby. And uh, truth be told, if you look across the street at Hogan Arena, there's even uh, police officers utilizing parking. Our community room that's in there, we utilize that for training periodically and there's, the parking lot doesn't uh, allow for enough uh, adequate parking. There's times that we have to go move cruises to make sure the public has ac access to the building. That parking lot uh, has been expanded in the past. The, my counterpart, Lieutenant Moss, retired. He, that was one of his projects that fell on his shoulders. There's an aerial view of the police station, the lower lot and the upper lot, and you can see that uh, there's really nowhere else to go. Uh, Deputy Chief Mills pointed out, if you come onto our property on either si the north and the south side of our property, this cat nine tails, it's all wetlands. There's no more room for expansion on going in either direction. Dispatch, we make it work. Uh, the, lobby area, the lobby area lacks adequate space for its uh, 8,000 visitors annually, uh, waiting area. We have a sundry of uh, people that walk through the building. It could be victims of crimes. It could be sex offenders looking to, re uh, to register, which they're required to do by law. We have, for some reason, it's a, it's a, uh, it's a change of the times. We have lots of uh, parents who have split that have custody issues, and uh, the courts have asked that they um, do their child swaps at the police station. Some do them outside. Some of them come inside the building for uh, the police officers to monitor. We have drug disposal areas in there. We process people for pistol permits. As you can see, the, en the engineer that, uh, that designed the door right in front of dispatch, we really have to be careful. There's been a number of people hit by the door when we're coming in and out of the building, and that is a secure entry. 
Um, that's a primary communications area. We've set it up with two and a half PSAPs right now, and those are the primary uh, locations where the 911 calls come in. And uh, we've made it work for us. We removed a bathroom to make the third, so the, there used to be a bathroom that was solely to be utilized by the dispatchers and the communications personnel, but uh, to put in another 911 station, that had to be removed, and facilities helped us with that. If you look in the closets, these closets, the closet to the right, uh, that's filled with the wiring, um, those closets were initially built for storage, and every spare location in that building, whether it was a coat closet, whether it was a storage closet, has generally been uh, modified or changed to, um, to be able to house the uh, com communications equipment and all the computer hardware throughout the building. That area right there is uh, just to the left of the dispatch, separated by a wall, and that is the records clerk, and she uses basically a rear view mirror. She's out of sight. Um, that was the previous communications director that's sitting at her desk. She, that was a shared space between the two of them. We we're completely bursting at the seams in that room. The room to the right is, was initially designed to be a kitchen and eating area for the personnel and the offices in the building. That was quickly overtaken by uh, file cabinets and storage and a Xerox machine. So the table that once was there is gone. That, what you look at is the lower level of the building. Um, that is dead storage. And we are required by law to maintain a lot of these old paper records, some of them dating back for many, many years, uh, predating my birth, and they're still down there. We're hoping, uh, as we move forward, uh, to comply with records law, to start digitizing a lot of the information to minimize the needs of the uh, storage of these records, some of them anyways. So the bottom three pictures depict the entrance to the evidence and storage, and we purge that as often as we can but we are at the mercy of the state when it comes to drug destruction and narcotics destruction, and we have to maintain certain articles of uh, evidence until the conclusion of a lot of these cases, whether they're either concluded in regular district or superior court, or whether or not they're appealed. This picture that you see is the uh, men's locker room. We currently do not have enough lockers to outfit the patrol personnel that we have there. Myself and a lot of the senior members of the command staff, we gave up our lockers to, uh, to, uh, I'll do a lot of a secure locker for the officers to secure the uniforms and their weaponry uh, at the end and the, uh, to commence their shift. Upstairs, the, the slide to the right is a closet that was modified upstairs for the um, detective personnel as extra storage and that was just a, just a uh, supply closet. So if you look in the, uh, the boil of the maintenance room, there is zero room for supplies. Um, it's, it's a very, very tight area. The generator is very close to the building. When we first moved into the police department, the generator that's outside auto fires and uh, would fill the building with, with, uh, with smoke and exhaust and set off the, uh, the alarm systems within the building. So we had to construct facilities constructed a, uh, an exhaust pipe that goes up over the, uh, the roof line of the building. The, uh, this is our primary sally port, and the picture that sticks out to me the most is the ambulance unable to uh, access inside the garage. The ambulance is too tall. They built the, uh, the garage is very, very short. It's problematic when you're taking prisoners out that are in custody, uh, not being able to secure them in the ambulance uh, with the doors being shut. The, uh, there's a lolly column that was, uh, that was engineered and designed in the building. I'm not sure if the engineer didn't uh, take the width the measurements uh, of the cruises at the time, but um, the officers have to be careful because the doors will actually impact the uh, lolly columns in the middle. So that's a current booking area downstairs. Um, we've made it work. 
We surpassed a time in my career when we were making over 1,000 arrests, 1,000 people taken into custody a year. That number's dropped a little bit over the years, but we're only able to uh, process one prisoner at a time. And there are many times that we have multiple prisoners that we, that we have to process at once. So the, uh, the booking processing area is very problematic because of its size and dimensions. And that brings us on to FIRE headquarters, and I'll be around to answer any questions that, that anybody may have at the conclusion of this. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Stephen Coleman. Um, I serve as your fire chief for the fire rescue department. Um, I'm thankful for all of you taking the time uh, to come out tonight. It's really uh, great to see a, a good turnout. Uh, to hear the presentation tonight. Um, I want to start off uh, just talking a little bit about uh, the growth of the fire rescue department and I'll, I'll spare you the last you know 50 some odd years uh, since fire headquarters opened although we'll talk about that a little bit. I want to just take a look um, at a 10-year uh, snapshot of the call volume. Since 2012 our call volume has been steadily growing um, on an annual basis. We've only seen one year uh, in the past 10 years where we didn't surpass our call volume from the year prior, and that was in 2020 during COVID. And the reason for that is, I'm sure you can all remember, is especially in the early months of COVID, in that March, April, um, there was fear in, in the world, and people were afraid to leave their homes, people were afraid to go to the emergency room. Um, so although we saw a decline in the amount of calls, um, the reality is, is that the people that we did see, especially on the medical side, uh, these patients were very, very sick. And the reason that they were sick is because if COVID hadn't happened, they would have dialed 911 and they would have called for help probably much sooner than they did. But we were showing up at people's homes who had been having chest pain in some cases for three or four days. Um, and some of, those, you know, some of those residents did not survive. Um, and it was a very scary time. Um, so that, that's really the only time over the last decade and even beyond uh, that we haven't seen a, a steady growth. I mean, at there, there was a period of a month where there were hardly any cars on the road, so motor vehicle accidents were down. Everything as a whole was, was down. But as you can see, in 2021, uh, we sprung right back up by almost 1,000 calls. And as of today, this afternoon, we've currently responded to a little over 4,600 emergency calls, which has already surpassed what we did um, in 2021. And we would expect, uh, just based on previous history and data, we expect that this will be the first time in the department's history that we'll break 5,000 emergency calls um, in the course of a year. So why I bring this up is this is important to look at in totality when you look at the fire rescue department in terms of the growth that we've had since fire headquarters opened in 1964, since the West Street opened in, in 1985. Uh, these buildings were designed for a much different operation uh, than we currently see today coming into 2023. In 1965, when fire headquarters, uh, I'm sorry, 64, uh, when fire headquarters opened, um, emergency medical services did not exist in the town of Auburn. There was not an ambulance. The police department, if you were sick enough, would put you in the station wagon and they would drive you to the hospital. Um, and according to annual town reports at that time in 1964, 1965, they maybe did that about 120 to 130 times a year. So there was no actual formal ambulance or med emergency medical services at that time. So what that means is that when the building was designed and opened in 1964, emergency medical services was not even a forethought at that time because it did not exist in the town of Auburn. It was also built at a, at a much different time in terms of there was no full-time staff in the department. It was a completely on-call or volunteer, however you, know, you want to look at it. Um, they were paid a, a small stipend back then. Uh, but it was a completely on-call department and there was no full-time staff. The fire chief was not full-time. The fire prevention office was not full-time. So again, a, a facility was designed with really, and I, I don't ever want to say there was no forethought because we weren't there, none of us were there. So I don't ever want to speculate what the thought process was in 1963 when they were designing it. What I will say, and this is only 
because I've had previous conversations with, uh, you know, retired Chief Bob Murray, uh, retired Chief uh, who's since passed, Roger Bellhumor. I've had conversations with these gentlemen where we like to say that it wasn't that the foresight wasn't there, but, but understandably, no one could have predicted what the agency was going to look like in 50 years. You know, it's, it's very difficult to do that. I've been in Auburn with the Auburn Fire Rescue Department for the past 17 years, and in some respects, um, it's really amazing to think of where we've come over the last 17 years in terms of the level of service that we're providing you know, to the community. So it's very, very difficult to forecast not only 20 years, but in this case, 50 some odd years. Um, so our current shift staffing today, we have a total of 40 uh, shift firefighters. It's broken down by four working groups who work 24 hours a day. So uh, each of those groups has a captain. After the first of the year, it will be two lieutenants uh, and then seven firefighters, and that's split between the two stations. That's split between the headquarters station on Auburn Street and the West Street station. So there'd be six members assigned to headquarters, four members assigned to the West Street station. So again, a much different look in terms of in 1964 when the building opened, these buildings were not designed to house any full-time staff. In fact, when headquarters opened, uh, I, you know, I, I have in my office, I have the original spec from 1963 uh, typed on a typewriter, the original spec, and I have the original building plans, and the original building didn't even include facilities for females. There were no female firefighters on the department at the time in 1963. The department currently employs six full-time female firefighter paramedics, um, and all of the space that they're in, their locker room, um, their shower facility, uh, that's all space that has been robbed from er other areas, and that area is the utility room. Um, their, their locker room and their shower facility um, actually sits in what was part of the old utility room. So again, when you talk about just you know, thinking ahead in terms of what was gonna happen, uh, female employees or female firefighters, um, the building had no design for that. There was no female bathrooms or locker rooms. There was a men's locker room, uh, but not female. So again, in uh, 1964, you can see on this top picture, this is what the station looked like and the frontline apparatus that, that came out facing Auburn Street. Um, the station has a total of six bays, four face the front and two face the rear um, facing Goddard Park where the rocket is. And the two, build, uh, the two doors that come out the back are the doors that are on the far right and the far left of the building. So those are drive-through bays. The two bays that are in the middle on this photo, there's a wall directly behind there. So we're, we're limited in terms of the depth on the middle. Um, and again, I, I'm not sure what the reason was in 1963 that they just didn't do four drive-through. Um, I'm sure cost was a factor um, at that time. So you can see the, um, uh, one other thing that I want to point out is when this building was designed, you can see on the left there's no second floor. The second floor was added by Bay Path High School in 1995. Uh, they worked with the regional vocational school for the carpentry department, the electrical department, and they put the second floor on. Chief Bellhumor at the time wanted to do a full building addition on the second floor, which would have encompassed going up above the bays. But when they did the engineering study, they determined that the size steel that they used in the building at the time was not structurally rated large enough to be able to carry the second floor addition. And in order to retrofit that roof structure and to build it, it was gonna outweigh the cost benefit at the time. In later conversations that I've had with, with Chief Murray and Chief Bellhumor, um, and this is a point that we'll talk about uh, later on in the presentation, um, it was, because uh, again, you remember, Chief Murray was on the department at the time when this building opened. And the reason that the structural steel was, the, or the, the steel that was put in that building was there was a conscious decision at the time because the steel, the steel that would have been needed to build an addition later in the years was an additional $3,000. And they made a conscious decision not to spend that money because they didn't anticipate that this building would need you know, future growth down, down the years, uh, down the road. 
Uh, the kitchen and the bunk rooms that are upstairs on the second floor were renovated back in 2017 by the DPW's facility division, and they did a great job uh, doing that. So this picture here illustrates um, the top picture when the building opened in 1964. Again, those were the frontline pieces. And you can see the size difference of the vehicles that are housed in there today. Um, take the tower truck, which is the one that's kind of on the bottom. It's the one that's closest to Auburn Street. Um, you know, it's difficult to even see the door. Even the rescue on the top picture, the far, it would be your far right, um, that was the town's old, uh, old rescue truck. The rescue truck in that same bay, um, you can see just the size difference. And what I like to tell people when we talk about the size difference of apparatus, because I've had people ask me this, they say, well, you know, can't you, um, can't you buy smaller apparatus? Um, one of the things that I pride myself on as the chief, one of the things that I take pride on as a department as a whole is um, we're, not real, we're not real flashy. When we design our fire trucks, we all have the attitude and the opinion that if it does not put out fire, if it does not serve a functional operational purpose, um, we don't want it. it it's, it's not on the truck. And if you look at our fire trucks, both our engines and our ladders, and you were to look at the surrounding communities around us and compare our vehicles by size to their vehicles by size, our vehicles are much smaller. And again, that's, that's by design, one, because we're already strapped for space, so it doesn't make sense to go buy a larger vehicle. Um, but two, larger vehicles don't work in this, in this community. The, the, you know, the, the engines that we buy are what we call city trucks. They have a much shorter wheelbase. They have a better turning radius. They don't have raised roofs, so they're flat roofs. The profile, both width and length and height, are smaller than the other fire departments around, including the city of Worcester. Many of the truck vehicles that the city of Worcester buys, they're raised roof, they're, they're a little larger. Um, so, some of the municipalities that we have that come for station coverage, some of their vehicles actually won't fit in this station. So we are buying our vehicles as small as our vehicles will go in, in order to be able to function. And the reality is, is that even if we're fortunate enough to get a new public safety building that has bigger doors and bigger space, that doesn't mean we're gonna go out and start buying bigger trucks. We, we buy the trucks that we buy because functionally and operationally, that's what works for us in, in this community. If the truck can't get down a street, it really doesn't make much sense in owning it. Um, but again, with that said, you can still see the size difference um, in a, you know, not only in functionality, but in safety. That, that's why fire apparatus um, and the modernization of fire apparatus has got the way it is. The picture on the bottom left um, I don't know if you can see it, I don't know how well you can see it, but right in front of the tower truck where you see the silver bumper, there's a black line in the road. There's like a black line right in front of the bumper. That line indicates Auburn Street. So if you're standing on that black line, you're actually standing in the road. It's hard to kind of see with the angle of the picture, but what I'm demonstrating here is that when the tower truck is pulled out of the bay and it's sitting in front of the bay, which would allow you to close the garage door, which is like it is here, the truck is only about six inches from actually being in Auburn Street. So it's a very, you know, the apron is not very deep. It's a very, it's a very tight space. Um, as you know, our back parking lot and the back area of the fire station, we share with Goddard Park. Um, and for those that don't know, and this is a good thing that I like to tell people, Guarded Park is a, it's going through a little revitalization right now. There's some you know, neat things happening back there where they're trying to freshen the park up. Um, but that park, that park gets a lot of use um, in the summer. There's, on a daily basis, there are people going back there, um, eating their lunch there, um, bringing kids there, walking around. Um, so there is a presence at that park uh, on a daily basis during, during the, um, the good months. The parking spaces that are back there technically for the park is the fire department technically, right, it's all one town-owned piece, but technically if you go back and look at how the, the site was divided up and what was supposed to be what, these vehicles that are parked back there, which is our employee parking area, that's technically the parking for Goddard Park. So all of the parking spaces that we take up, 
we're sort of taking away from and sharing with um, the park as well. Um, we have a bunch of ancillary uh, trailers, some of which are Auburn owned, some are regional assets, and there's a huge uh, benefit to hosting those regional assets. We won't get into that. Um, but the reality is, is that we're taking up quite a bit of space behind the fire station uh, just with some of the assets that we own and host. So Kevin uh, Kennedy, when he spoke, he talked about when the committee was looking at spotting a fire station or a public safety building, I should say. And again, the fire department was the one um, that we really had more restrictions on where we could go than the police department. And Kevin Kennedy already explained that. Um, and response time was that driving factor. For the, we'll call it 5,000 emergencies that we will have done in 2022, our average response time to those emergencies greater than 95% of the time is three minutes. That's an amazing response time, in case you didn't know. The national average and what NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, recommends is four minutes. So we are under that standard by a minute. And that's largely because of the locations of our fire stations, both on Auburn Street and the West End. We operate both fire suppression equipment and EMS equipment, meaning an ambulance, out of both of those stations. So depending on which district you live in when you dial 911, providing that vehicle is available, it's the closest piece of emergency equipment that's going to be responding to your home. So that, that really helps in, in kind of condensing and keeping that response time down. I said from day one to the committee that I was interested in talking conceptually about a joint public safety facility. Um, I think that there is a lot of benefit to it, um, but I was not willing to agree to or put my name behind any project that was going to jeopardize our three minute response time greater than 95% of the time. Um, that's not a value to the community in any way, shape or form. So because of that, as Kevin mentioned, our circle became really small when it came to where can we site this facility that we would only, you know, and again, not even that, not affecting a response time even greater than 30 seconds, in my opinion, is, is worthwhile. But you have to be reasonable. And I was willing to, I was willing to go up to 60 seconds, that if response time wasn't going to be affected greater than 60 seconds in, in either direction to District 1 or District 2, that that's something I would be comfortable with. Um, the prime spot, the, the ultimate spot, for those who may not know, is where the driving range is, where the water district is. That is the true center of Auburn. If you put a pin right in the middle of it, that's the middle. And ultimately, if we were to site a facility based on response times and based on if everything was equal, the water department site is where you go. And there was a very short period of time where we thought maybe that site would work. Maybe we could carve out a little piece of the water department. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, um, federal law does not allow that. 100% of Auburn's water comes from aquifers, and federal guidelines don't allow anything to be built or constructed within 300 yards of an aquifer. So there was not even a sliver of that parcel that when you started running the radiuses of 300 yards, the water department was very quickly ruled out because it's not, it was not a viable site. So that left us with Bed Bath & Beyond and Shaw's, it left us with Sears Auto, and it left us with um, the Langway property, or the old Lowe's. So the problem with, with those facilities was Sears Automotive and Shaw's and Bed Bath and & Beyond is obviously very close to fire headquarters, and it it affected response times in a negative way to the west end of town. Um, that aside, those property owners did not want to sell those parcels. So first and foremost, the property wasn't available. Um, and then when we looked at um, the Langway site, it was, it was within that um, under the minute that 
we were willing to live with. Um, but the reality is, is that uh, the property owner is asking a lot of money for the site, more than we feel it's worth, um, more than we were willing uh, to come to the taxpayers with to say we would like you to consider this, this, um, this property. And again, because he does not want to sell, um, we've had a couple of people ask us, well, what about eminent domain? And uh, town administration, along with myself and the police chief, um, you know, members of the committee, uh, you know, generally, um, it's it's not something we're a fan of. Where we we don't believe in, you know, going in and saying, well, you know, you don't want to sell it to us, so we're going to take it. Um, coupled with, it's a very long and lengthy and expensive endeavor. If we were to enter into, and I'll just throw some real quick numbers. Um, that, that we estimate. Uh, if we were to seek $6 million for the Langway property, uh, but we had to go into an eminent domain battle, by the time that is said and done, in terms of what the courts could have awarded that we pay, because at that point, it's not really us determining, it's the courts determining not only what the fair market value is at that time, but they also have to calculate any potential revenue loss that they may have had for that property. We estimated that that eminent domain case taken could have been close to the $11 million mark. <clears throat> and I, uh, for those who have maybe been paying attention to this project uh, a little longer and watching some of the public meetings, um, I said at a Board of Selectmen's meeting one night publicly when the question of eminent domain came up, um, I just said that I personally could not support an eminent domain taking of really any property, but specifically that property, um, because I could not in good faith and conscience ask the voters to spend that kind of money on land before we've even started talking about constructing a building. Um, it's not something that me personally, I could do. And I think that every member of the committee and every member of town administration, we all felt the same way. So. That is sort of what drove the committee to say, okay, well then what's, I don't even want to call it plan B at this point, because at this point we're probably up to plan D, right? So what is plan D? Um, the West Street Fire Station is the one that is in the most need of repair and replacement. So it just made sense to, well, let's look to focus on the West Street site, we'll leave fire headquarters alone, uh, and then we can make some of the modifications that need to be done there fit into the town's capital as we move forward. So that's a long way to get around this slide, which is one of the reasons why the West Street site is not a, a viable site is because fire headquarters sits in the FEMA regulated floodway. And why this is a problem is because the federal government does not allow you to make any substantial modifications, and that, that doesn't, and really what the substantial modifications comes to is you can't enlarge the footprint. So we can't do a renovation or expansion on the Auburn Street site without the federal government stepping in and ultimately saying you've just made yourself ineligible for any federal grant money from this point forward. And they have done that in other municipalities across the country some have said, doesn't matter to us. The town of Auburn is not in that position. We receive a lot of federal aid for various things in the community, out, not only public safety, but schools, transportation, um, economic development. Uh, it, it's not something that we should be willing to roll the dice on um, to basically just say, we're not gonna accept any federal money down the road. Um, so no expansion is able to happen on the, on the headquarters site, which again, that's okay, because if we're successful in building a new fire headquarters and a new police headquarters on West Street, the current headquarters site is a suitable size for a sub-fire station. There will need to be some modifications done to that building to come up to current safety issues. There are some issues in the building, um, but it's not something that we're even talking about bonding. Like I said, all of those modifications can be done, fit into the town's five-year capital plan as we move forward. So again, I think what you need to just think about sort of in totality when you're thinking about the fire rescue department is that um, 
neither of the buildings were designed to do what they're doing today. Emergency medical services wasn't a thing. Uh, Full-time fire suppression wasn't a thing. Uh, fire prevention and engineering, none of that was a thing in 1964. Um, the lobby space, we have a lot of foot traffic that comes in on a daily basis. Um, currently at headquarters is where all the contractors come to pull various permits. Um, any more than three people in this lobby, which happens on occasion, any more than three people standing in this lobby is crowded and sometimes somebody's got to, we, we'll let them into like the communications room or we'll let them into the apparatus floor um, just so they don't have to stand in, in tight quarters with, with a couple other people um, while they're doing their business. There's no seating, there's not even room for a chair um, in the lobby. It's limited security. Um, you know, we have had occasion where, um, you know, people have come into the building. You can see actually the lock on the door, uh, on like the bottom right, we put in programmed doors. There was a time where um, that door wasn't, uh, wasn't locked. And those locks went on the door because we had a gentleman come into the lobby. Um, he was um, mentally disturbed. Um, he opened that door and he pulled a knife on the firefighters that were in the watch room. So those locks went on the door. So um, security is an issue. We have very limited security in the building, but security is an issue. Um, by federal law, the fire station is a baby safe haven, which means that that front door has to be unlocked all the time in the event that someone uh, is going to drop off um, a baby uh, in the lobby. So we've put as many provisions in as we can. Um, but this lobby in this downstairs area is not monitored 24-7, but at 3 o'clock in the morning, you're able to walk into the lobby, um, but you're not able to get in on, on either side. Um, but that space has to be open um, under the baby safe haven law. And we do a tremendous amount of medical walk-ins. Um, people, uh, usually if it's not every week, it's every other week. We have people either walking by or drive into the fire station parking lot that are having an array of medical emergencies from chest pain to unresponsive people in cars. So we do a lot of medical emergencies either in the lobby or in our communications room just outside the lobby area. Our current conference room um, is about 170 square feet. It seats no more than 13 people. That's extremely tight um, in that space. This space was once part of a, mar a larger meeting room. If you've ever been in the uh, fire, current fire headquarters, and if you haven't, I please encourage you to reach out. I'd, I'd love for uh, you to come and take a tour of the building. We had a resident come yesterday and tour both fire stations and the police station. It was, it was awesome to have him um, yesterday. So I encourage you to come and, and take a visit. Um, but the current space right now that occupies the conference room, the deputy fire chief's office, and my office, the fire chief's office, that was once a larger meeting room. And that space has had to be divided into three separate spaces as the department has grown um, over the years. Much like the police department, um, we have very little storage. We have tried to carve out, and I think we've done a pretty good job of trying to utilize every open space that we can in the building. Now, when the second floor addition was put on the building, we obviously needed a staircase to go to the second floor. What we gave away to put the staircase there was the men's locker room. So we had a locker room when the building opened in 1964. In 1995, when the addition went on the building, we lost our locker room to, a, to the staircase. What we've done is this storage area right here is actually under the staircase. So the door on the far left, that's not a full-size door. The height of that door is five feet. That's as much as we could get in with the header under the staircase. Um, but underneath, we, carry, uh, we keep a lot of our fire prevention education equipment and our administrative assistant, she has a lot of overflow files and permits under the stairs. So she's in and out of there, usually on a weekly basis, going underneath the stairs in those file cabinets, um, filing old records. Um, again, it's just, it's tight quarters within the station. Um, the trucks are very close to the doors. In some case, it's like a foot, foot and a half, um, depending on the truck. Um, like even me, I, I like to consider myself not a big guy. Um, but that's a, it's a tight squeeze. You know, you gotta, you gotta kinda, you know, finagle your way in, in front of the trucks to the doors. And it's not that we can back the truck up because 
there's something behind it. There's, there's another vehicle behind it. Our rescue truck, which is on the far right, um, when that truck backs into the building, there's a one foot space between the wall and the bumper. The Jaws of Life, other rescue equipment is in the back of that truck. So the firefighters, when they do their morning checks, they can't actually go behind the truck and open that up and pull the equipment out. So every morning that truck has to be pulled forward a couple of feet or it's just pulled right outside in order for them to do their daily equipment trek. So it's not in a position where you can just check the truck 360 degrees around while it's in place. Um, this for the most part, the four trucks that are sitting up front has a little more room between trucks, but behind those four vehicles where there's only two doors going out the rear, there's still four vehicles in that second row. And what you're looking at here is those four vehicles side by side. So even you can see that the mirror is folded in on that truck. It's folded in because if the mirror is out, you can't get by the mirror and the ambulance in order to get in that truck. And even when you get in the truck, you can only open the door so far to the ambulance and then you gotta suck it in real hard and then, you know, to get into the truck in order to, to pull that out. <clears throat> We're gonna talk a little bit about, you know, and, and one of the things that, that I think both the police chief and I, when we talk about is, you know, modernization. And police officers, firefighters, we do a good job of doing the best we can with what we have. And I think we've done that for a very, very long time. Um, but the, the type, the facilities that we have just don't offer the modernization or the things that make the jobs more effective and efficient. And one of the bigger concerns that I have is, is you know, on a daily basis is anything that we look at that is, that has, is directly related to firefighter health and safety. So in modern facilities, and we'll talk about it kind of in a little bit, but in modern facilities, there's separate areas where you can wash contaminated equipment, dry contaminated equipment, um, and those are done in kind of private spaces that are not in areas that we're working all the time. That does not exist in any of our buildings. So we, our gear washer is on the same floor where the trucks sit. When we dry, we don't, we don't have dryers, so all of our equipment has to be air dried. Um, and this is how we dry equipment. We hang it off of ladders, we hang it off the back of equipment. Um, there's, there's no way that, that that can be done in the way that it should be done in, in 2023, and we'll look at what those systems are. This is our workshop area. Again, if you look on that wall, you'll see two vertical black lines that go down. And what that's illustrating is in, in 1964, when this building opened, this area here, was the workshop, okay? There was a workbench in there, um, much like today, this is something that really hasn't changed over the last 50 some odd years, is the firefighters do a lot of maintenance and repair and fixing of equipment that's in the building. So there's a, there's a shop in there. Over the years, as we uh, took on emergency medical services and we became a paramedic level service, we had to put a wall up in the shop so we could create an EMS storage area. And then when we had you know, shift supervisors, um, the shift supervisors used to sit on what we call the administrative side of the building, um, but when uh, the deputy chief you know, position was created you know, 17 years ago, um, the shift officer was moved out of the administrative side and we had to put another wall up in the shop. So the captain's office at fire headquarters is actually, it's in the utility room. It's in the same room that the water service comes in, all the main electrical panels for the building are there. It's actually where the boiler used to sit before the building was converted to natural gas. So I was just in the captain's office today. We're talking about how do we sort of, you know, modify again without, again, we're, we're trying not to throw good money after bad, um, but we're trying to figure out a way. Um, one of the big struggles we have over there as we come into the winter months is that, that office is on an outside wall that never had insulation on it because it's the utility room. So moderate, trying to regulate the temperature in that room, is, it's nearly impossible. Um, it's very, very drafty. So this just illustrates that what was once, you know, sort of a large working space, we've had to divide that up over the years into three separate spaces. Moving into the West Street Station, the biggest problem and challenge that we have with this building is Although headquarters was designed to be a fire station, and although it poses many operational challenges today, 58 years later, the problem with West Street 
is this was never designed to be a fire station. This opened in 1951 as the Randall Elementary School. And dating back to the 40s, the Massachusetts, I'm sorry, the New England Insurance Rating Bureau, who's now called uh, ISO, they're the ones that rate your homeowner's insurance and they set your insurance rates. Back in the 1940s, I have a report in my office that says that the New England Insurance Rating Bureau recommended to the town in the early 40s that they construct a fire station in the area of Southbridge Street at the intersection of West Street and Southbridge Street. That recommendation was made in the early 40s. It wasn't until 1984 when the town took action to open the then decommissioned Randall School as a sub-fire station. And town meeting appropriated $80,000 to put these three garage doors in the building. And that was it. That was the extent of the renovation to open the building. Today, the pull-out cafeteria tables still sit in the walls. The bubblers for the elementary school are still sitting on the apparatus floor. Up until two years ago, the performance stage that was on the cafeteria floor was still in place. And we ripped it down within the last two years because we just needed the space. And so the firefighters, they demolished the performance stage just so we could squeak just another 10 feet out of the, out of the bays. Um, all of the, the renovations or things that have occurred to this building since 1984 have solely been done by the firefighters. No major capital expenditures have ever been put into this building since 1984 because the answer has always been, well, we don't know what the future of that building is going to be so we don't want to put any money into it. Well, you know, 35 some odd years later, the same, we're sort of in the same boat today. We don't want to make any major investments because we don't know what the future of the building is going to be. But the reality is, is that building today is a 24 hour day, seven day a week, 365 staffed fire rescue station running fire and EMS with a lieutenant and three firefighters. And we are literally working on an elementary school cafeteria and the, the administrative or supervisory space in the living space is essentially untouched from what it was when it opened in the 50s and we're just working out of what was a food storage area or what was the you know, cafeteria supervisor's office or whatever. Um, very, very difficult conditions trying to manage a modern day fire rescue operation. We have been forced because we don't have room at fire headquarters that the administrative staff at this building has continued to grow. Um, our two full-time fire prevention officers, one of which is a fire protection engineer, so we have our own engineering division in-house. They operate out of the West Street Station. We have a full-time emergency medical services coordinator um, who is, uh, he is not a firefighter. He focuses strictly on the EMS operation and EMS education. And his job is out of the West Street Station. And after the first of the year, we'll be getting administrative support to fire prevention and EMS that will ultimately be housed at the West Street Station. Fire prevention being out there is difficult because they report directly to me. And Usually when they, they'll call me up and they'll say, I need you to see something, I need you to look at something, and then I have to get in my vehicle and drive to West Street so they can show me what it is they're looking at on their plan table or the, the software that they have that we don't have at headquarters. So it makes it very difficult to kind of supervise an administrative division that's not in the same building with you. So there, there are challenges, but we, we make it work. Again, much like headquarters, um, the space is tough. Um, it's not as big of a deal in the summer months where we can keep some of the smaller ancillary vehicles, staff vehicles outside. Um, but in the winter time, when there's inclement weather, these vehicles have to go indoors, but they don't have their own bays and they get, they get stuffed in between um, the other spaces. On the far left, you can see, there's a better picture of it, but you can see that that's a boat. You probably can't make out what it is, but that's actually where the performance stage sat. That opening, that square opening, the stage jetted out two feet from that opening. So we demolished that just so we could tuck the boat in there sort of on an, on an odd angle because it used to sit between one of these two trucks, 
but we needed to move that so we could get the ancillary vehicles inside. <clears throat> in this building, there is zero storage space. There's, there's none. We had one storage closet that within the last couple of weeks, we had to remove it as a storage closet to house the IT equipment because the IT room is actually in the same room as the HVAC unit. And we have a lot of condensation issues in there and all of our IT equipment um, is molding. We've had to remediate mold from the building on two separate occasions. Um, so we, we were forced to really eliminate and that was the storage cabinet that kept everything from EMS supplies and IV fluid to the vacuum cleaner. It shared the same, it shared the same closet. There's no dedicated space for gear washing or drying. There's no locker facilities. Um, men and women share the locker facilities out at West Street. Um, and again, this locker space right here, this is probably a total of about 50 square feet. There's about three and a half feet between the front of each of those lockers. This picture on the right, this is quartermaster storage. Again, right outside the locker room, right outside a bedroom, this is where bunker coats, pants, helmets, gloves, all of the stuff that we consider to be contaminated hot equipment. Although it's been washed, it's still contaminated hot equipment, and there is no place to store it, so we're forced to store it on a rack in the hallway outside the locker room. Um, the picture on the left, this is one of the bedrooms. We keep a lot of our bulk storage in the bedrooms because there's no other place for it. So toilet paper, cleaning supplies, uh, medical equipment, anything you can think of, um, they go for store. It, it gets stored in the bedrooms. The room on the right, this is the lieutenant's office. Because there is no office space in the West Street Station outside of fire prevention and the EMS coordinator, the lieutenant's desk is actually in his bedroom. Okay. Um, this is obviously a human resource problem by department policy. The supervisors are not allowed to talk to employees in their office, I think for obvious reasons. Um, so it's not a great situation when, you know, the, the supervisor's office, with, which they're trying to manage the day to day, um, is in the same shared space as their bedroom. This space here is where the performance stage was ripped out. Um, you can still see the remnants of the ductwork and the brickwork in the back. We have to kind of saws all that out to get that out of there. Um, but again, there's no storage. So all of the loose equipment that we have, there's no room. There's no physical room with a door that we can put it in and close the door and it's, and it's out of the way. It's all basically, it just leans on the walls. It's anywhere that we can find some open space to try to just keep the equipment. Um, that's where it goes. So let's take a, a quick look at modern public safety facilities and, and some of the trends. And what I want to stress when we jump into these photos is these are stock photos provided by the architect. These are not renderings of what we are proposing. This is not, uh, this is not what we are proposing. Again, much like the, much like I talked about with the fire trucks, and I know the police has examples on, on their side in terms of we don't need that. It's, we don't, we don't need that. We can do with this, right? We all have that same mindful approach, okay? Um, we just saw, as a department administration yesterday, we just saw these boards that are sitting up here. We saw those for the first time yesterday. These, these are the first renderings that we've seen. Um, because COVID kind of pushed us back, we were hoping to see something sooner, but they couldn't give us any renderings until we committed to a site because the site drives what the design is going to be. So they did a good job in the last 30 days just trying to put these together, um, but we think what's up here um, is a very reasonable ask. It's a very Auburn looking building when you look at it. They took a lot of design elements from the middle school, um, which the, the property will obviously be very close to the middle school, so they took a lot of design elements from the middle school. Um, but it's a, it's a brick building with a flat roof. It's, it's very Auburn, and we like that. You know, it's, it's not a very fancy looking building, but it, it's the inside, you know, that matters, and it's the layout, and it's, that, it's those kind of things um, of a modern, you know, public safety facility. Um, I can speak for the police chief when I say this, and uh, town administration feels the same way. Um, we, we are never going to come before you as a voting body, as the taxpayers of this community, and ask for something that we don't need. 
we're never going to do that. And we're also going to be very reasonable in our ask. Um, the pencil has been very sharp during this project. We met yesterday with the architects. Um, some of the room areas grew in square footage and some of them shrunk, right? There was give and take on both sides. But one of the things that we're trying to do with this project is we're trying not to make some of the same mistakes of the past where in 20 years we're coming to you and saying we need to do an expansion on the public safety building. I'd, I'd be just as aggravated. And it's a comment that we've heard up to this point. You know, why didn't they do this then? Why didn't they do The reality is, is we don't have the answers to those questions. Could of and should have things been done differently in, in some respects? Sure. Um, but we're, you know, we're, not, we're not here answering for those decisions. We weren't here and we weren't, we weren't in those positions. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to balance um, the operational need of both of the public safety departments today with what these organizations may need 50 to 60 years from now. And I already told you that that's very difficult to do because I can't imagine what my job is going to look like in 50 years. I can't even imagine it. But we have to do a better job as a, as a community, as a committee, as administrators, in at least trying to get people to recognize that we can't continue to put ourselves in a situation where the police department in the last 60 years has been in three buildings. Every 19 years over the past 60 years, the police department has needed a new building because they've outgrown it. We know what mistakes we shouldn't be making in terms of at least doing some, some forecasting into the future of what we need may need, at least from a square footage perspective. Um, and I think that we've done a good job and I think the committee has done a good job in, in putting together a project that fits the needs of today, but also kind of has the future in sight a little bit. Um, the lobby of this building will be centrally located in the middle, so that will be, whether you're there for police business or fire rescue business, um, the lobby will be the central focal point when you come in, adequate areas for seating, there'll be some rooms off the lobby for to be able to talk to people from an investigation standpoint, if, if a police officer or a detective needs to talk with somebody, there'll be a small room off the lobby that's set up very similar to a doctor's office for walk-in medicals that we can usher people in that are bleeding or having chest pain. We can usher them right into a room. There's an ambulance stretcher already there. We can start care and treatment in that room while the ambulance pulls around, get that situation going. Um, so it's, it's creating a more welcoming space, a larger space, um, for the public uh, to come in. Right now, in either building, we do not have adequate, we don't have a training room. The fire rescue department does not have a training room. The only room I have is the conference room that seats 13 people. I do not have a training space where if I wanted to hold a training for the department, um, I have to do that off-site. I have to do it at the police department or I have to do it in a school building or somewhere. The police department's um, training room uh, does not fit does not even fit the occupancy of their current patrol staff. So very, very undersized. Um, so this training room uh, would be much larger where, you know, we could do a mix of both police and fire. Uh, we want to do a lot more joint training, regional training. Um, and it also serves as the town's emergency operations center, which the current community room and uh, training room at the police station, that currently serves as the town's emergency operations center. So in the event of severe weather events, hazardous materials, spills, anything large scale where we need to get all the players in one space, um, we activate the EOC in that location. So this will just give us a more modern, updated um, EOC. Uh, the dispatch center, uh, it's very small in our current space. We're in the process now of we just, again, we had to take a restroom down in order to put in a third dispatch position. Um, and the current problem in the, in the communications room now is their, their back is to you. So when you come to the window, all of their computer monitors, they're facing the opposite direction of the window. So oftentimes they don't know that someone's there right away, but more problematic is when you're standing at the window, you can see what's on those screens. And what's on those screens is private and confidential information. So the communications room would need to be flipped. So you can see in this photo, all of their screens are forward facing, and then you can see when people come 
uh, to the window. Just more, you know, modern, uh, you know, patrol spaces, a uh, place for the police department to have uh, morning roll call, both police and fire every morning. Uh, we have roll call, um, adequate locker space, uh, report preparation. You know, right now on the, the, in the fire department, um, we don't have a report writing area. The report writing area is upstairs in the living space and they write their reports on a folding table. So there is no, there's no report writing space. Just larger evidence and processing rooms. Again, you'll hear, uh, you'll hear the word storage, 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 storage a uh, hundred times over. And you, you know, when, when you don't have it, it seems like you talk about it a lot. Um, again, a garage that's you know, free of lolly columns, uh, just a larger space where you can kind of operate. I won't get too much into this, but basically it's bringing all of these things up to, up to current, current standards. Um, on the fire side, it really comes down to um, decontamination, um, hot zones versus cold zones, which means hot zone is anything with contaminants, cold zone is like administrative space. There's no separation in either one of our fire stations. My office is right off the apparatus floor. So there's a fire truck that's running two feet on the other side of my, on the other side of my door. So there's, there's no separation between hot and, hot and cold. Um, modern facilities at least provide some gender equity. Like I said, um, Auburn Police just swore in this week um, their second uh, full-time female uh, police officer. Um, we currently have six um, full-time female firefighters, um, and our current buildings right now offer, offer no gender equity. So in a, in a modern fire station, the turnout gear area is separate from the apparatus floor. So it's its own room. And this room has, is, it's pressurized, it has its own kind of air quality and monitoring system. So the contaminants are dealt with in this room, but the washer dryer space, um, you'll see on the far left, those are the turnout gear washers. And then on the left, that's the dryer. Um, right now, you saw what we use for dryers, it's a step ladder. On the right, our washing machine just sits in the apparatus floor right outside what's the same toilet essentially that the public would use. It's the public restroom on the apparatus floor. The washing machine sits right outside that office on the, on that bathroom on the apparatus floor. So basically it segregates all of, all of these spaces. Um, the police station in 2000 when that opened it was supposed to have a gym. Um, the gym was cut from the project as a cost savings measure. One of the things that's important to note both on the police and fire side is that we have physical fitness standards um, that are enforced by the Commonwealth that we have to have. We have certain presumptions um, and physical fitness standards are there. At any time, a member of our departments could ask to prove, have to prove their physical fitness standards. Um, so health and wellness is huge in our, in our building. Most of the employees in all of the buildings, they, they work out at, at gyms or whatever. So um, to be able to have a uh, facility within the building to keep our members physically fit, uh, that's good for the community as a whole, it's good for the public. But what, what people have to understand is sometimes people look at the gym as a luxury in a building. Firefighters and police officers are held to different standards of employment that are directly tied to our physical fitness. So that's why it's an imperative part of um, the job. So you can just kind of see some of the other, some of the other spaces. Um, so some of the advantages to uh, the joint public safety facilities is we get to share a lot of the same infrastructure. One of the things that the committee looked at was knowing that something had to be done to all of our buildings. Do we build a new headquarters, a new substation, a new police station? We looked at that, what that would cost, and it was, it was a lot of money. It's a lot more money than what's being proposed for this project. But that also comes with three separate generators, three separate physical plants in the building. Having one joint police and fire headquarters, we get to save a lot of money in terms of the physical plant when we're looking at a lot of the shared infrastructure. Again, shared spaces like police and fire would share a gym, there'd be one gym, share a lobby, share a classroom, share all of the HVAC and all of the other types of equipment that go with managing the building. Um, again, I'll be sticking around um, 
it, we'll have a Q&A after this, but at this point I want to turn it over to Ed Kazanovich, uh, the town's assistant town manager and CFO, to talk a little bit about the budget of this project. Okay. Uh, thank you and good evening, everyone. Um, I know we have a f some new town meeting members. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ed Kazanovich. Currently, <clears throat> Assistant Town Manager, Chief Financial Officer, and soon to be your next Town Manager. So I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Um, I've been asked to present to you tonight uh, the financial impact as we know it today. Uh, and it's probably the least flashiest component of this presentation tonight. And probably the most painful. But we wanted to be upfront and honest with you as to uh, what the impacts are going to be. And certainly, please do not hold uh, me to this, because uh, things are changing on a daily basis as a result of uh, today's economics. So what I wanted to present to you is back in November of 2020, and I want to identify the cost, increased cost of borrowing money. So when Tecton first presented a, uh, a cost estimate, of a proposal that pegged the construction of a new facility just shy of 40 million with a uh, land acquisition cost of 6 million. Um, the total price tag for the project was $46 million. Um, back in November of 2020, we got a debt and interest uh, amortization schedule for a 30 day period, a 30 year period. Um, for 46 million at a rate of 3%. That was the borrowing rate in 2020. Uh, please be advised that that rate was um, given to us based upon our current credit rating of a AA plus with Standard & Poor's. The cost to borrow $46 million, and I want to emphasize there's a construction cost and there's a interest we have to pay for borrowing that money over a 30-year period in time. So a $46 million project in November of 2020 at an interest rate of 3% uh, yielded a interest payment of just shy of $25 million over a 30-year period, $24,449,400. If you add that to the construction cost estimated at 46 at that time, um, the total price tag was $70,449,400. And the cost per $1,000 of value uh, at a house value of $252,400 uh, meant a tax increase of $240.61. When we take that same $46 million today, the interest rates we can now get is 4.85. So it's just shy of a 2% increase in interest rate. That 2% interest rate resulted in an additional $17.7 million of interest over a 30-year period, bringing the total construction cost to $88,237,000. That would mean a House now that's valued um, at 363000 would be a $473 increase annual to the average, uh, average home assessed at 363 uh, Let me just say that these schedules came in today as a result of some um, um, recent information we, we received from Tecton yesterday and today. Um, okay. Um, the estimated construction cost today, given the increase in construction materials, which has been estimated at 30 percent, um, in addition to the, uh, the increased rate of interest, 
a $55 million project at a AA plus rating at a 4.85% uh, average coupon rate that we would pay based upon our rating uh, would be for the average home of 363000 it would be an increase of $567.62 annually. Now, that would be about $1.56 per 1000 of value on the tax rate. Um, but in addition to that, we, that's the gross, uh, we are retiring the high school debt in 2024. We're currently raising about one and a quarter million dollars annually to pay for the debt and interest on our current high school. We went out for a 20 year purpose on that high school and we're retiring that next year. If we were to apply the savings as a result of retiring that debt, the net debt on the $55 million uh, public safety facility complex would go down from $567 annually to $367. Also want to identify that in year 14 of a 30-year debt schedule on the public safety facility complex, we would also be retiring the debt and interest that we're paying on the middle school. Um, that building was occupied in 2016. We're in year seven of a 20-year debt schedule uh, with 13 or 14 years to go. That savings could be applied towards the debt and interest payment of the new public safety facility. I think certainly we understand the magnitude of this project, and I think both town administration and um, our elected bodies would recommend that this project be brought to the voters, that they have a say as to whether or not uh, they want to proceed with this project. Despite the fact that we have excess levy of 8.2 and can fund it through the operational side of the budget if, if we wanted to, we would never recommend that. Certainly, we think this, this decision rests with the residents and the taxpayers here in Auburn. Um, so that's an impact as we know now. Certainly, that's going to change. Uh, the, uh, the economics and the inflationary factors are driving uh, the rates upward. Um, what I would like to underscore also, like we did with the Auburn High School, is that if this project does move forward, we would recommend a callable provision on our bonds in years 8 through 10, uh, where we could refinance the debt for the remaining balance of the project if the interest rates are lower. We did that for the high school in year 8, and we saved the town roughly $3 million as a resulting of that refinancing. So that's a snapshot. Certainly we'll keep you up to date as things change uh, and as cost estimates come in. Certainly we're not going to know that un until this project goes out to bid. Um, but we will first need approval by the voters uh, through a debt exclusion vote in order to do so. So with that, Julie, Steve, I don't know if you have any closing comments, but that's, um, that's an estimate of cost now. I just want to bring one thing to your attention when it comes to, uh, let's see if this thing will. So I just want to bring one thing to your attention. Um, the top section of this was what this project was going to cost pre-COVID in 2019. Um, it, it's probably difficult to see, but the two things that I, I want to point out before we open it up for question and answer is in 2019, the price per square foot to build this project was $510 a square foot. Fast forward two and a half years to 2022 as it sits today, 
the same building at the same square footage, it's going to cost $750. The price of construction alone, not the other ancillary things that go away with it, debt and interest, but just the construction cost alone and the square footage difference in two and a half years has raised this project by $13 million. It, it's a result of everything that you know, we're facing as a nation. We would have loved to have been able to kind of be in a position to bring this you know, to the voters in 2019. I don't think anybody anticipated that we were gonna be where we are you know, today. But I, I, why it's important to bring this up is it's never going to be any cheaper to build this project than it is now. Um, arguments could be made in terms of trying to kick the can down the road a little bit to see what happens with interest rates, to see what happens with construction costs. I think we've all been around long enough to know that these things are not going to come down. The interest rates, they'll, they'll come down at some point. Um, but I don't think we're ever going to see a $510 a square foot construction cost again. I, I, those things are not going to come down. Um, we've seen many municipalities in this area that have sort of taken that kick the can down the road approach. Um, and, and some of these communities are, you know, voting projects that have been voted down for the last 10 or 12 years that they're now spending more than double to build the same square footage building that they've been just kind of waiting to see if things get better. Um, we recognize and acknowledge that um, the, the timing isn't great in terms of, you know, the, uh, the interest rate. Um, most likely that can be addressed down the road because I think the interest rate is the one thing that, that will come down. Um, the rest of it from a construction standpoint, um, we don't see that happening. Tecton Architects doesn't see that happening. They gave us an interesting stat yesterday that since 1990, there has only been one time in that 30-year mark where construction costs went backwards. And that was in 2009 when the economy collapsed in 2009. The building trade and the construction of the cost per square foot to build went backwards. In no other time in the last 30 years has it done that. And in the last 30 years, the average inflation for construction costs has risen 5 to 7 percent roughly over that 30-year time frame. In the past three years, it's risen 18 to 25 percent. So again, those are not sort of good signs that construction costs are going to slow down or that construction costs are going to go back down. You know, Tecton yesterday, these guys have been doing this a long time. Um, and they said that they doubt they'll ever see a, f a five to seven percent increase. It, it may not be the same 25 that it has been over the last three, um, but it's probably going to hover more around that 15 to 18 moving forward. They don't ever see a time where it's going to go back to just a five to seven percent slow. Um, so again, we, we know that this is a huge decision for you. Um, but I think just in, in fairness, we just want to point out that <clears throat> we don't ever believe that there is going to be a time where this project is going to cost less money. At the end of the day, we can cut, you know, we can continue to cut square footage and we can continue to sharpen the pencil and do what, you know, what we, what we d um, can do to try to bring the cost down. Um, but I can honestly stand here tonight and, and say that you know, we've done that. Is, is there a little more room that we could probably, probably do? Yes. But again, we're trying to balance that with what I said earlier about trying to be responsible for the next 30 to 50 years too. So it's a balancing act. Um, but this community is never going to build a public safety building for less than $50 million based on square footage construction costs, the space that we need in order to be able to function, it's never going to be less than, than $50 million. So <clears throat> the big decision that the community needs to make as a whole is are we willing to sort of stop the bleeding now and build at $750 a square foot with the interest rate that we're in now in hopes that we can, in year eight, 
bring that interest rate down if we, if we rebond? Or do we kick the can down the road a couple of years and hope things get better? Um, I personally don't see that happening, but that's a decision that, that you, as the voters and the residents of the community, need to decide. So thank you very much for your attention. I know it's been a long hour and a half of, of listening, but we feel it's very important information. I'm glad most everybody made it to the end. Um, but at this point, we'd open it up to question and answer. Um, if you have a question, we'll bring a microphone um, to you so you don't have to get up and, and walk down. Uh, but we encourage you to ask um, any questions um, that you may have. Deputy. Are there going to be, through Homeland Security, any grants possible that we can use for this project? So the short answer to that question is no. There is, there is not currently, nor has there ever been um, a grant program, state or federal, that has allowed for construction dollars for fire stations. I cannot remember, there's a part of me that wants to say that maybe in the 90s there was some money available for some police renovations. For, yeah, joint public safety back in the early 90s. Since then there has been no federal dollars. What I can tell you is that um, the state legislature is looking at possibly funding a grant program for standalone police, fire, or joint public safety complexes, similar to the state grant program, the MSBA program, that we took advantage of to build the new middle school. Um, legislation has been filed, or if it hasn't been filed, it's being filed in this upcoming session. I've had the opportunity personally, I've testified twice now before the state senate um, advocating for that program, but as it stands today, there is no state or federal grant program that would allow money for a public safety facility. <clears throat> Deputy Mr. Talmason. I am Russell Talisman. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you and you. Uh, I was kind of on the fence about this, but uh, this was extremely enlightening. I do see the need for something. The dollar value has kind of got my knees buckling a little bit. But um, if, this, if we had all these green lights and we could move forward now, how long would it take before this project actually got underway? Because if it's years down the road, that's going to affect everything. That's a great question. Thank you, Mr. Talisman. So we've been developing timelines to try to come up with an average amount of time. I would take, tell you an average amount of time would probably be two and a half years. And the reason I say that is because it all depends. If this goes to the voters in May on the annual town meeting ballot, then two weeks later, excuse me, it would go the other way, uh, it would go early May to town meeting, and they'd probably have to take a vote that's conditional upon a vote of the ballot two weeks later in May. Uh, if it were to go in that timeline, by the time you then get those approvals, then go out to bid, get your architects, get your design, get your construction, from that point, you're probably looking at two years. Um, some will aggressively say 18 months. Uh, that doesn't generally happen. So I'd say two years from the point that you have your approvals would be very aggressive. The way, the way costs have been going up, I, that's, that is, uh, it's an alarming uh, figure to look at. I know we were all, you know, we, we, we know costs have gone up. We've all seen that go up. And as the chief, you know, adequately said, costs don't come down. They're, they're going to continue to go up. What may come down will be the interest rate. So maybe as the cost of the construction goes up, it may be offset as the interest rates start to come back a little bit. And as Ed pointed out, down the road when interest rates change. We, we've done it once already. We went out for the high school debt, refinanced the high school debt when the rates dropped, 
and we were able to save $3 million, which was significant on the total value at that time. So down the road, in addition to using as a middle school debt gets retired, and you can look at refinancing, you may be able to save on your interest costs, which are going to offset your construction costs. But again, that's why we feel the longer we wait that we're not seeing anything but escalations here in cost. Uh, and I have to say, it couldn't have happened in 2019. The figures that you saw for 2019, we show you those to show you that when we first started talking about this, that was the year the committee got together. That was the first year that Tecton started to do the analysis. So we weren't ready to go at 2019, so it's not like we missed the, the, the opportunity at that time. We weren't there yet. But we're just showing you, now that we are there, if you wait another three years, look what could conceivably happen. Chief? So, yeah, that's an interesting. So when you go out to bid for a project, so of course this project has to follow under Mass General Law procurement laws. Uh, and when you go out to bid for a project, you can have a budget in mind and a contractor, a number of contractors could come in and bid something completely above what you've determined the price may be. And at that point, you have two choices. You can either uh, reject all the bids, go back to the drawing board and value engineer, meaning go back and make some, some changes if you can. If you can't, you may likely have to go back to the voters and get approval for additional dollars. So hold on one second, if you don't don't mind. Sorry. Uh, yes, I have a couple Thanks. of questions. Uh, the first one to the fire chief uh, is there. Uh, I didn't see the motorcycle there. Is there a plan to exchange that for an ATV or something? Or I uh, I, I I I can't get behind. Uh, a Holly Davidson in the woods, but other than that, uh, the other question was uh, on uh, green and energy efficiency. Are we looking at alternative energy sources, uh, solar, wind, whatever, in in the general town to maybe provide some of some of the relief for oil cost and gas cost? Sure, to, to answer your first question, the, the motorcycle isn't breaking our space issues. That's a, that's a specialty unit that backs up the police department. Our paramedics are assigned to the Semlec motor unit that ride on that. Um, the hours that go in by the paramedics that are put on there are donated. The lease is donated by Sheldon's. Um, that's, that program costs us less than $1,000 a year to run for the community. It's a special operations program. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about tonight. The, the other question about solar, yes. There is a plan on some of the um, out structures for, uh, I, it's not the, is it the Sally Port that has the vehicles under it, or is that just the outside garage doors? There is a plan to put solar on the roof, much like the middle school um, did recently. The middle school wasn't constructed with solar, but last year or the year before, they installed solar on the roof of the middle school. Um, we have had discussions, although it's early because we're not in the design phase, um, but we have had discussions about installing solar. Um, the building, because Auburn is a green community, it will have to be built with pretty much those are the building construction standards today. It's very difficult to build something today that's not green um, because that's just where energy is going. Um, but yes, all of the things that could be put into place to offset energy costs, those are things that have been discussed up to this point. Um, question for uh, Chief Coleman. Actually, two quick questions. Uh, one, what's the plan to kind of rehome what's now the substation? during the time where the construction will be done? Because I assume you know, the building is there, probably going to be complete raised. I assume there will be some sort of hazardous materials given the 1940s and whatnot. The, the other question to, for you would be, what kind of concern has been taken into to effect for the traffic for that particular area? 
as a, a parent of a previous middle, middle school student, I know getting over there during pickup and drop off times can be a little bit hairy and I've always wondered you know, how you guys and gals get in and out of that building as it is. But right now I know it's a little bit tight during certain times of the day. Yeah, I, I, think, I, got, I think I got most of that. Um, so that's a great question. And I'm gonna add something actually to the first, the first part of the question, which was where do we go um, while the building is being raised and demolished? <clears throat> so although it will be extremely tight, um, and the reality is, is I, we don't have enough space, but we're gonna have to make accommodations, temporary accommodations, the operations side so the, the fire and the EMS personnel will be assigned to the headquarters station during that time period. Um, we will have to store um, some of our spare equipment, our spare engine, our spare ambulance. Um, we will have to try to fit those into existing facilities, um, either an outbuilding on Rochdale Street that the town owns, um, the DPW, we'll, we'll have to fit. We have some storage issues that we need to work out. Really the larger part of that question is, um, and this is something that hasn't really been addressed tonight, but it's, we'll, we'll address it because it's part of this question, is the school administration building, which is on the other side of the fire station. So school administration has to be taken into consideration here as well. Um, since this project has started, um, we have been in talks with the school department. We've actually had two recent meetings within the last week with the school department. The school department is interested in taking over the existing police station. So that is a question that's often asked is, well, what are we gonna do with the police station? So whether it's the school department or another municipal use, um, that building does have a future as a municipal building in the town of Auburn. Um, you know, one of the things that I've said publicly, we said it on social media, you know, the police chief will, will say the same thing. We're never gonna stand before you and say that our buildings are not in good shape. We're, our buildings are well maintained, they're in good condition. We take both departments, we take a tremendous amount of pride in our buildings. Our building issue is not that the buildings are crumbling and falling down. Our issues are operational in nature, they're spaced and it's modernization. It's just we've outgrown these facilities and at least on the fire side, one of the two facilities that we're operating in was never designed for its function in the first place. So the school department is interested and we are currently talking, the police chief and I will actually be attending the school committee meeting next Wednesday to talk with the school committee about this in, in, in further, having further discussions. Um, there will need to be um, some renovation to the police station, again, to make it suitable for the school department operation. Um, but they are interested in moving over there. In the meantime, these are some of the things that we have to talk about with the school department is they'll need to be re relocated you know, to a space for a period of a couple of years. Um, so those are already, those are conversations that are taking place right now in the event that, that this were to pass you know, this May or June. Um, so those are all things that although in early stages, those are all things that are being taken into consideration. But the short answer to your question is, at least on the operational side, um, the firefighters would be moved to headquarters during that period of construction um, so the building could be raised. What was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, traffic. Traffic on West yep. Street. So, that's a, so again, great, great uh, topic. Thanks for bringing that up. So when the middle school was constructed, um, between the DPW engineering, um, there were a bunch of traffic studies that took place on West Street. Um, traffic, as the police chief will tell you, it's probably the number one complaint in town, you know, by residents. But sometimes there's a perception that traffic is worse than it is. And when the traffic studies are done, um, specifically to West Street, um, the traffic numbers were under what they were anticipated. And all of the road reconstruction that was done as part of the middle school project, um, that was done to accommodate whatever traffic issues may happen on the road. As part of that, they also addressed the fire rescue need by if you're standing in front of the bays of, the, of Station 2 and, you're, and you look directly across the street, they installed a pole that has um, what's called an Opticom device on it. Now, that's a device that turns the traffic lights green in the forward direction that we're moving. So 
prior to the middle school being built, there's an Opticom on the light at Stafford Street, but it didn't trigger until we pulled out of the station, made a right, and then the sensor on the truck met the light, and then it turned the light green. They put a forward-facing Opticom that faces the fire station, so now when the doors come up and the emergency lights are hit, it's starting that process much sooner than before we were even leaving the station. So 90% of the time, by the time we're pulling out of the station and, and making the right onto Southbridge Street, the green light has already been lit for probably 30 seconds and traffic is already moving in a forward direction. Um, my staff will tell you that we have very little issues on, South, on West Street with traffic. There's two times during the day where it gets really bad and that's morning drop off and pickup. And morning drop off is far worse than the afternoon pickup. Um, it seems like more kids get dropped off than actually picked up. Um, but that's usually for about a 20 minute span. But I can tell you that we've, we've run into very few issues traffic wise on West Street. Honestly, the more issues we have related to that are parents that are actually pulling into the fire station lot and parking in front of bays or parking in front of the, you know, in our parking lot, waiting for kids to walk to them. That's more of an issue than the traffic on West Street. Um, so we don't, we don't see that as a concern. As part of this project as well, if you look, there will be, it, it probably won't be a public entrance, um, but they, we will have Southbridge Street access from this site. So police cruisers will be able to come in and out of Southbridge Street as well and not necessarily utilize West Street if they don't have to. So there is two ways off of this site. So looking forward 50 years from this project, have we done considerations in the design for things like electric charging of police cruisers, um, aerial drone use, um, things like that? These, this would all be retrofit, but I think if we're talking about building a, you know, what could end up costing $100 million when it's all said and done, have we you know, done some, some thinking forward on things like that so that these could be retrofitted into the building, you know, when they become prevalent. So as part of the uh, Town of Auburn's Green Initiative, uh, the town manager has already begun working on that with some of our acquisition of some of the electric vehicles. The police department uh, purchased their first two hybrid vehicles. They're, where they're in full use, they're on patrol, they're assigned. Um, I'm hearing good reports back. I'm hearing some negatives with uh, other area agencies that are experiencing problems with them, but I'm sure as technology improves and uh, the town's initiative has not changed, well, there would certainly be um, uh, charging stations installed at, uh, at all the municipal buildings. That's what the hope is. Is that yeah. accurate, Julie? Absolutely. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, that's accurate. We, uh, I think at the end of January, we're going to open our first electric charging station behind Town Hall. We had a grant to do that. Uh, we have identified four, if not five, other additional sites. We wanted to get the first site underway first. And then as we get more grant money and as we get more electric vehicles, we would be putting those probably at the, um, at the joint public safety facility, the, likely at the library, possibly at the senior center. So as long as there's grant funding for any part of this project, whether it's the vehicles or the building, when we get to design, as somebody mentioned, we are a green community. We're proud of that. We received designation from the state in uh, June of 2012. And as a result, we are eligible to apply for a number of different grants. We've received over a million dollars in green community funding alone, and we intend to continue to apply for those types of grants. So as we can incorporate green technology and as we can get grant funding to support that, we're absolutely uh, looking to do that. Well, when, when a question goes on the ballot under Mass General Law, the Board of Selectmen vote to put a question on a ballot, or it can go on a ballot from a citizen's petition. So in this case, our recommendation is that we go to the Board of Selectmen, ask the Board of Selectmen to make a decision to put a question on the ballot. 
there's two things that are needed. The question on the ballot would determine whether the project would go forward. The town meeting would actually authorize the money for the debt exclusion. So, Ed, do you want to add anything to that? Or, so you, did, you would need both votes. Uh, my recollection um, is that that process started in about 1980, and uh, it took about 20 years for uh, town meeting uh, and the voters to ultimately approve that. So Julie is correct. Uh, the Board of Selectmen would have to vote to put this on the ballot. It would have to be approved by the voters, and either subsequent to that or as a condition of that vote, town meeting would have to authorize a borrowing to fund the project uh, that would be adequate enough to, to, meet, the, um, to meet the bid. Um, and I, that would we require a two-thirds vote of town meeting. It's a borrowing, so it's a two-thirds vote. Yeah, my question is, is how much land is going to be coming with this project? How much land is the town going to own with this project? Because like this gentleman was saying, uh, you know, 40, 50 years from now, Auburn's not going to look like this at all. It's just going to keep growing. It's going to be busy. So would there be enough of land on this parcel to expand? Because it's probably going to have to happen. And then is there going to be enough of land to expand parking? Because parking is a problem everywhere, especially in this facility, if you're going to be running training and classes. You know, so how much land are we going to have to deal with this? So that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so originally, one of the recommendations from the committee was, and if you're familiar with the site, where Perro's Auto, the used car dealership was on, on Southbridge Street, and they shared a parking lot with McCoy's Action Karate. So those two buildings were right there. The Perro family owns that entire parcel, and they own the two buildings that were on that site. Um, unfortunately, uh, Mike Perro, who was the principal and the president of Perro's Auto, Auto um, he passed away um, this past year. and. The committee at the time uh, made the recommendation that town administration approach the Perro family and ask if they would be willing to sell their land as part of this project because the original thought was it would have been really nice that if we could have obtained the Perro's property and we leveled those buildings that we could have a forward-facing building to Southbridge Street that would also provide a lot of parking in the front. And then, because right now, when you look at these designs, this building is forward facing to West Street. So, uh, town administration, um, our town manager, um, had conversations with the Perros family. Unfortunately, the land is, is not in a position to be sold right now because Mr. Perro passed away. Um, the land is, is being held. Um, so it's, it's just not in a position, without going into too much detail, it's not in a position where it can be purchased. Um, <clears throat> so Tecton Architects um, has said that it can be done on the West Street site. On the site that we own right now, it can be done. What this, and this is a good kind of uh, move into this, because what's not demonstrated here is, again, I said yesterday, this is the first time that we saw these designs and we talked about a whole lot of things yesterday in, in a design meeting. This building will go up another story. So the design is to put, the building on the administrative side will actually be three stories, not two, in an attempt to shrink the footprint a little bit in, in order to gain parking. Now what Tecton has advised the town, and it makes sense, is that at some point down the road, maybe that's five years from now, maybe that's 10 years from now, at some point if the town has the opportunity to purchase the Perros property, then the town should consider doing that for the exact reason that you just mentioned. In another 30 to 40 years, if we look to expand the building, 
we have the ability to kind of move towards Southbridge Street. Tecton will be designing this building in a way that whatever is on the end of the building facing Southbridge Street will have the ability to build out and up providing the land is available. Um, can I sit here right now and tell you that parking is everything that we're gonna need on the existing site the way it sits? Probably not, parking's tough everywhere. I mean, they built the, the new middle school and they were out of parking a year later. I mean, parking is just one of those tough things to kind of figure out. Um, but the, the original plan, and it just didn't work out, is the town did try to make an attempt to purchase the Perros property as part of this project. That's just not gonna work out. But the building and the adequate parking that we need based on occupancy and all of those things, it will fit on the West Street site, but it is gonna require us to go up an additional floor. Um, but the town at some point down the road should probably keep an eye on trying to purchase the Perros property so we have the opportunity for future growth in 30 to 40 years. I just have a couple of quick questions specifically related to the demolition of Randall and the cost associated with that. Is there an estimate and is that number factored into the construction cost of this, of this new building? Um, and then another quick question to that is if the school department is to leave that building and move to the old police headquarters, is there a cost for renovating this substation if we were to have picked something more centrally located for the combined building. Can you just repeat the last, the very last part? That's the part I, we didn't get. Yeah, sorry. I, I think I said it out of order. So in the scenario where we had been considering a joint building centrally located in town, is there a cost that would have been associated with school department moving to police station now and renovating Randall to meet the needs of a substation for the fire department? So, yeah, so I think it depends on the plan. Like if, if we were able to find a site that did not currently sit, you know, that did not involve a police, a, a fire station, we would have been in a situation where we could have stayed in those two locations, built the brand new building, and then both fire stations close, we move into that building, police department moves in, the school department would have been able to stay in their location, obviously, until the police station was renovated for them to move in there. We wouldn't have had to look at alternate space. That would have been a perfect, that would have been a perfect scenario, a perfect world. Because there is no land available to build that centrally located station, and we're forced to sort of look at the West Street site, um, so that's, that's where those other things come into play. There needs to be temporary relocation of, of the fire station. There needs to be temporary relocation of the school department. And yes, there will be a cost um, to renovate uh, the police station. Um, we don't have a, a ballpark on that number. Um, the, ta the conversations that we had with the school department this week is we will probably do an add-on to the contract with Tecton. They're, they're an outstanding firm to work with, and we'll probably have Tecton look at the existing police station and work with the school department to design it in the way that it's gonna work from them. Um, but I think the decision, and I, you know, the CFO can speak um, on it, I think the decision has already been made that the renovation or the relocation of any of those things will not be part of the borrowing for this project because those dollars are going to be much smaller and those dollars are something that we will probably be able to handle within existing funds or within operating budgets. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to pay interest on the money for those kind of things. So those associated costs will not be part of the borrowing for this project. And so for the, the demolition cost of Randall under this plan, is that included in the construction cost? Yes, so again, we do not have a demolition cost, but the demolition cost will be part of this project. And then my, my last question is, um, knowing that the town owns the parcel of land behind the Horgan Skating Arena, and that there's a considerable amount of land over there, was that site considered for a joint 
effort for the public safety building. I didn't hear what parcel of land you said. Yeah, so the, the parcel of land directly across from the existing police station behind the Horgan Arena. Okay. Oh. Lemansky Park, yeah. Yes, yeah, so uh, to answer your question, yes, Lemansky Park was looked at. You know, when you think of it, we initially thought, wow, you know what, that's pretty central, as you, you can picture where the driving range is central. Lemansky Park is central also. And we looked at the fields and how could it fit in there. Tecton took a look at it. The issue that we ran into with Lomansky Park is that it was purchased, oh, back probably 40, 50 years ago, using land, federal land and water conservation funds. And that requires that anytime you remove land that was acquired with federal dollars for that purpose, you have to replicate that land. And not only do you have to replicate it, but you have to rebuild whatever you're removing. So let's say we removed a baseball field right across from the, from the police station. That would have to be replicated on land at least as large as what you're, you're taking back. And you would have to put the cost into the replication of the field. The process for doing that involves both state and federal approvals. On the state level, you need uh, legislation and you need approval from uh, DCR and one other state organization. On the federal level, you need several layers of approvals. We were told that at a minimum that process would be three years just to get the approvals to move part of Lemansky Park to another site, replicate it, and get the permission to even start it. And then that would add to the project. So when we looked at it, we thought that three years is going to cost. Is, it, there's a dollar value to waiting three years for that. And as you can see, this is the dollar value of three years of just doing the preliminary work on this project. So waiting another three years to maybe get approvals to do that was not an optimal situation. So the committee decided at that time not to move forward. Yeah, so through the chair, uh, through the, I'm so used to saying that, through the chair, through the, through the chief. <laughs> He's absolutely right. There, there is some land in town that we could replicate it on. Uh, we do own some land. Some of the land that we looked at to replicate it on was not going to be amenable to the state and federal officials who we ran it by. So there is land that we could have put it on, but the cost to bring the infrastructure in there would have exceeded the cost of actually replicating the field itself. So the land was a little bit of a problem. Uh, and again, it's because of the source of the funding that was used to purchase the land in the first place. Mr. Chair. One more question is, sure. have you considered uh, trading up a piece of land that we own for a piece that somebody else owns? Uh, we've done that in the past, as a matter of fact, where the Fallon Clinic used to be where the bank is now. Uh, when, when they built that, the town originally owned that land, and we swapped the land with the owner for another piece in town. Uh, and the other thing is that we considered like taking the highway department area and refitting that with a police fire because of its access, both the 20 and 12 and the pipe, and just relocating it to DPW at one of the other pieces of facility, mm -hmm. uh, one of the other facilities that we own. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that's a great question. We actually did look at the DPW site. We looked at every single site that the town owns in the entire town. We overlaid potential three to four acre parcels where we could possibly put this. The problem with the DPW site and a couple of areas down off of Washington Street that we thought might work would not have worked for the fire department. That would have been more problematic for them. Being right off of Route 20 would have been problematic for the police as well. So the DPW site itself wasn't large enough. Uh, as far as land swap, it's not allowed under Mass General Law, which is why we have to go out to bid. So while it sounds like it's easy, you know, there's land for sale, why don't we just go purchase the land? Unless you can prove that there's no other parcel that meets your needs, you have to actually go out to bid and solicit proposals to purchase land. So we put an RFP together, which is a request, excuse me, an RFQ, a request for qualifications. We actively and aggressively marketed that to landowners and developers as well as real estate brokers. But 
the town is required to take bids on land. We can't just decide we like that parcel, we're gonna go after that parcel. Because if there's another parcel that could meet our needs, then that's against Mass General Law procurement laws. So you're not allowed to have a land swap. So we would have to go an RFP process to make the purchase, and then we'd have to have another RFP process to make a sale. So we can't just sell our property to someone that we choose. The only way to do that, sir, and it could be done, it has to be done legislatively. So we did something similar to that off of Faith Ave with one of our local companies where we, we did a so-called swap. It had to go through the legislature to get that done. It takes about a year to a year and a half to get legislation approved by the state legislature to allow you to physically to swap those parcels. And that's the only other mechanism that's available to us. But it's a great question. Any other questions? I, I do want to say, first of all, we really thank you. We, um, we were hoping that we'd have everyone out, and in two hours we're kind of close, but we just, as the chief mentioned, we just all feel it's critical to keep all of you informed, to keep the public informed. The committee did meet, as you saw, for on and off for three years. Uh, we have several of the committee members who are here, and they can tell you how many meetings they sat through, and they were public meetings. So it, those meetings are out there also if you want to look at them. They were, uh, there's minutes for them. They were, most of them were televised, especially as we went through COVID because we had to do them remotely oftentimes so you can see those. But this is not the last meeting. It may be the first that we've actually come back to the public after a couple of years to keep you informed, but it's not the last. Over the next couple of months, we're gonna continue to have conversations with the residents, with our town meeting members, with the taxpayers, and give you whatever information that you feel you need to make an informed decision if and when this does go to a vote. I say if because it could be at the May meeting and it could be a special town meeting. If it's not ready for May, the Board of Selectmen could take a vote to have a special town meeting at a later part in the year when maybe it's a better time to go. So those decisions still have to be made. But before we get to that point, we wanna make sure we can answer your questions. So if you think of something after you leave tonight, don't hesitate, uh, contact any one of us. We're happy to answer your questions. If we don't have the information, we'll get it for you. Uh, and then we will bring it back at the next meeting and make sure that we start and kick off that meeting by giving you that additional information that we didn't have tonight. So, oh, yes, Wayne. I want to thank everybody. You did a great job tonight. Um, the thing that I want to bring up now, which probably could have been brought up later, is I would like to see this go to a townwide vote for approval, not just town meeting, but the whole town get the uh, right to vote on it because they are all taxpayers mm -hmm. and they should have the right to do so. Thank you. Uh, yes, absolutely. That is what town administration has been recommending. That is the conversation that the select board has also been having, both the current select board and the select board that was here a couple of years ago. For any major issue like this, we all believe this needs to go to the voters. The town meeting vote is the authorization for the funding, but we feel the approval to move forward with the project lies with the voters of this community. So that is our recommendation. I have no doubt that will be the route that the Board of Selectmen goes as well. So it's a good point. Uh, one more thing I think I want to mention, because there was one slide we didn't include, but I, I think it's just important to note, because when you talk about options, you know, what have we looked at? And people say, what land did you look at? What sites? We probably evaluated a dozen sites. We narrowed it down to maybe five or six that really needed to get more detailed information. But we also looked at what is the cost to replace each of these buildings, which obviously they're going to need replacing. Buildings, these buildings were not built, as the chief, both chiefs explained to you, they weren't built for the use that they have now. They're not gonna be able to be used 10, 20, 30 years from now. You're gonna have to replace them. So if we didn't do a joint public safety facility, we looked at that too. Is it more cost efficient to raise those properties on the land they're currently on and rebuild. And that has a lot of problems as well because you're stuck with certain footprints because of the uh, flood zones. But just to show you what, for an example what that would be, a standalone police headquarters to replace right now would be about $30 million. A standalone fire headquarters would be about $25 million. A standalone fire substation to replace the West Street would be $15 million. And the total cost for the three of them is 70 million. So when you look at the options, it is far less expensive. While I, we, we're not telling you it's not a large figure, $55 million is a large figure. 
but it is less than the cost of replacing these buildings, which is going to have to be done. We've been very cautious, as the chief says, we, we put money into these buildings as we need to, to keep them as operational as they can, but they need so much more, and we don't want to waste dollars putting money into facilities that we may be demolishing or changing the use or reusing some of those buildings. So we're doing the bare minimum in the buildings that we need to to maintain them, to make sure that our assets are good, but the problem is, as everyone said, it's the operational side. The operations don't work in these buildings. So these buildings are gonna have to be replaced. So whether you're looking at a joint facility today or you're looking at replacing three facilities tomorrow, you, you have to look at the difference in the cost. And it is more cost effective to build a joint public safety facility now. So I think um, without going into anything else, if anyone else has anything else, we, I think we're all set. We really want to thank you. We'll hang around. If anyone has questions you want to come up, again, give us a call. Sometimes you get home and you think, oh, I wish I had asked that. So please don't hesitate to do that. Thanks.